Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the May 3rd, 2021 work session of the Salisbury City Council. We have uh, several items on the agenda tonight, and we're going to get right into it as soon as we have a proclamation from uh, Deputy City Administrator Andy Kittrow. Mr. Kittrow? Yeah, um, I'm really excited to be able to read this proclamation this evening um, for a couple reasons. Um, for those who don't know, I am the proud parent of a child with special needs. Um, he's autistic. Um, so, you know, this is near and dear to me and I'm married to a child psychologist. So uh, this is definitely uh, an interest to our family, uh, both personally and professionally. So without that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Whereas good mental health is a key component in a child's healthy development and Children's Mental Health Awareness Week provides the opportunity to focus on this important matter while celebrating the accomplishments of children and families affected by mental health concerns. And whereas the United States Department of Health and Human Services reports that one in five children is diagnosed with a mental health condition and research has shown early identification and appropriate treatment of mental health disorders among children and adolescents, provide them better opportunities to lead full productive lives and whereas children and youth with mental health challenges and their families benefit from an access to timely services and supports that are family driven youth guided and culturally appropriate as well as the integration of behavioral health and a primary care education and child welfare and whereas children mental health matters is a maryland public education campaign co-sponsored by the mental health association of maryland and the maryland coalition of families which brings together nonprofits, schools agencies and other partners with the goal to raise public awareness of the importance of children's mental health, help reduce the stigma of mental health, let parents know that they are not only in caring for children with mental health needs, and most importantly, connect families throughout Maryland with the information and services to help their children. And whereas it is important that children and adolescents, along with their families and communities, learn about warning signs of mental health disorders and where to obtain necessary assistance and treatment, and whereas obtaining a full and accurate diagnosis of a child requires gathering information from diverse sources, including the family, school, and others involved with the child. And whereas Children's Mental Health Awareness Week is celebrated annually during the first full week of May to raise awareness and understanding of children's mental health and illness. Now, therefore, I, Andy Kitzrow, Deputy City Administrator, City of Salisbury, do hereby proclaim May 2nd through 8th, 2021, as Children's Mental Health Matters Awareness Week. Now with that, um, we do have a, a few folks from the Common Creek County Public Schools here who oversee the, the school's efforts uh, with delivering the Mental Health Matters uh, mission in the campaign. Um, so I know I've worked with Meredith Miller in the path, past on this, and if, if, if you give me the pleasure, I'd like to introduce her and let her spend a couple minutes uh, just talking about how this is important to the, to the community. Thank you, Andy. Good evening, everyone. I just would like to first say thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity um, to just kind of share a little bit about the campaign. Um, Andy kind of summarized it in the proclamation, but as you all know, this past year, year and a few months has um, kind of taken a toll on everybody, but especially our students. Um, and the focus this year is, you know, the importance of being healthy, not just in our bodies, but in our minds. And so that is one thing that we're trying to, um, you know, stress to the students as far as, you know, positive um, coping skills, taking care of themselves, as well as, you know, teachers and staff taking care of themselves. So they are mentally healthy to be able to address the needs of the students. Um, unfortunately, with COVID, we weren't able to host a big community event this year. However, all of our schools have numerous activities going on throughout the whole week. Um, you can follow it on our Facebook page, which is Wacomico Public Schools Mental Health Awareness. Um, I don't want to take up all the time. I have um, Blair Catlin Brown on here, who is from Salisbury Middle School, who's the school social worker there, as well as Angela Blake. She is one of the social workers at Choices. So if they would, I'd like to give them the opportunity to say anything um, while they're here. I'll go ahead. Thanks, Meredith. Um, so it's my second year at Salisbury Middle School, and I will say that we do a great job at Salisbury Middle School, especially considering this is this, I'm the first social worker they've ever had of really embracing the needs of the mental health of our students and staff. So that was 
awesome. I came from Somerset, so that was awesome to see in Wicomico. Um, so this week we're kind of we're making sure that we're catching the kids that are at home and in the building. Um, so we're doing a flip grid activity where the kids and staff, because we felt like staff really has a lot to contribute in knowledge and information, are doing a flip grid about where they talk about what have you been doing to keep your mental health strong. And the winner, there'll be a raffle and they'll get a mental health toolkit. Um, we're doing little treats for the teachers and the teacher's lounge because it is also teacher appreciation week and teacher mental health is student mental health. So we wanna make sure that our teachers stay strong. Um, we're, partnering, we're partnering with food services to put the, these little bookmarks that Children's Mental Health Matters gave us on um, information about the brain and, and anxiety and mood in all of the food bags on Thursday, along with our casual day and green that we're wearing on Thursday. And lastly, we've been working all school year, but really focusing this week on improving our courtyard. And we're trying to find funds to do an outdoor classroom because study after study shows that outdoor time equals better mental health outcomes. Um, so we're really embracing that this week. And we were able to get some great grants from Salisbury University and from the Community Foundation that have really helped us beef up all of that work. So that's what we're doing at Salisbury Middle. Well, just quickly, briefly, just as a social worker at Choices Academy, um, working with students, um, I would say, uh, I, I don't know if I would use the word the most vulnerable, but they're pretty vulnerable uh, population. It's a, it's a subset of the public school setting. Um, children are referred there for a variety of reasons. Um, and it is very vital to be an ongoing assessment and also break, breaking the stigma of mental health. And I think the more we talk about it, the more the families are comfortable with it and sharing um, some of the family dynamics. So this is um, a great event. It's a great week to have throughout the schools. And we just hope that our community partners can also spread the message. And thanks, Meredith, for all your endless, endless, endless energy and effort um, for us at all such social workers at the board and keeping us all coordinated and organized. Thank you, Angela. Uh, thank you, ladies, for uh, for your input. Um, as many of you may know that uh, this subject is very near and dear to my heart after being the CEO at Lower Shore Enterprises for several years. And uh, certainly, well, uh, our relationship when I was there with the schools was was really positive. So we thank you for what you do. Uh, it's it's a it's not the easiest job in the world. I'm, I'm well aware, and uh, it takes a lot of patience. And uh, thank you again for, uh, for what you do. Okay, I think uh, this time we'll uh, get into the uh, agenda itself. Um, Director of Infrastructure and Development, Amanda, Amanda Pollack will take us through the uh, latest update from Chesapeake Utilities. Good afternoon, Amanda. Good afternoon. In your package is the monthly update from Chesapeake Utilities. They are continuing with the installation of the gas main throughout Salisbury, and right now they're at approximately 64% complete with the pipeline installation to date. They're looking at having the pipeline installed by potentially the end of June and starting the tie-ins on the north side um, late June or into uh, the third quarter of 2021. And they are completing restoration as they go along. There hasn't been a ton of update in the last month on the rail trail, but we do continue to work with them on that. And then additionally, Chesapeake Utilities has submitted to us a planting plan for the Lake Street Playground, which we are reviewing and reviewing with field operations. So I'd be happy to pass along any questions that you have to them. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, I'll open the floor to questions, Mr. Boda. Um, I don't have any at this time. Okay, Ms. Jackson. No questions. Thank you. You're Ms. Blake. <clears throat> One question, Amanda, are they also going to be responsible for doing a, a tree planting um, between I, I think Evo and 13? So they, they are not planning to put trees back there because they don't want trees over their pipeline, which we agree with. I mean, we would typically not want trees over our water or sewer mains either. So they're, they're not putting trees back in that same place where trees were removed. Hmm. Okay. Mrs. Gregory? No questions. Thank you. 
Thank you, Amanda. Okay, next on the agenda, we have a proposed budget amendment to replace the HVAC condensing unit at the fire department. Chief Tull is gonna to make the presentation. Good afternoon, Chief. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And what you do have in front of you is a request for approval of a budget amendment in the amount of $31,945. And that's to cover the unexpected calls for repairs to our HVAC system located at our headquarters facility. Uh, the system has experienced a failure of the condensing unit and the internal coil that has resulted in a loss of air conditioning throughout the entire building. Um, you can see in the proposal the work that's going to be completed and it would be done on citywide contract. Uh, the company that has been awarded the bid through Department of Procurement. Uh, this unanticipated expense for repair was unforeseeable to foresee. Without this transfer, um, it will have to be pushed off into July. And just to let you know, as of leaving the building today, the temperature inside the building was 83 degrees and it was 70 degrees on the outside. So it was much uh, warmer on the inside of the building. Uh, there's no way for us to open up windows in that building because they're all sealed windows. So. Okay, questions uh, from the council? Mr. Boda? Uh, no questions. I'm, I'm okay with moving forward with this. Thank you. I don't think the chief needs to be wearing shorts all summer. <laughs> Ms. Jackson? I'm okay with it as well. Thank you. Ms. Blake? No questions. Thank you. Mrs. Gregory? No questions. All right. We will move this forward. Uh, Ms. Nichols, I understand that we, at the end of the meeting today, we will have the first reading of this uh, this item, correct? Okay, thank you. All right, Chief, that's fine. Thank you very much. Hopefully we can get this in before it really gets warm. Well, the the uh, um, the issue that we're having is it's a five week delivery of the equipment. So we're gonna be pushing into June, uh, mid June before the, uh, the unit is actually in for us to have it installed. Okay, we'll see what we can do with that. Um, Maybe you will next, be wearing shorts. It might be. Uh, next up, uh, we have an ordinance to amend the fire prevention code. Chief, you have that one as well. Yes, sir. So this is just a uh, annual amendment where we constantly review and update the fire prevention code based on changes in NFPA codes and changes that we've made to our department. So what you have is a request to amend the fire prevention code and add additional permit requirements, which will include uh, to perform any fire hydrant or fire pump water flow tests and the sale of consumer fireworks. So we're looking for those to be added as a permit requirement. Chief, I have one question before I turn over to the council. Um, in the past, didn't we allow private concerns to do that at the expense of the uh, manufacturer? Who? Or the, that again? Didn't we at one point allow for private uh, testing to be done and then the uh, information sent to us, whether it's, whether it's working or not, that so they paid for the expense? Yeah, there was some third party testing that was allowed before. Is that going to be still allowed? I believe so, yes. Okay. Could you just get back and verify that for me? Yes, I will. Thank you. Mr. Voda, questions? Is there what's the cost for the, the fee for the uh, fireworks permit? Um let me I'll pull that up real quick and let you know. Because there, there will be a, a, a fee for the permit, correct? That is correct. Uh, the For a sale of consumer fireworks, so a standalone tent on commercial space is $250. 
than other commercial space uh, issue for the sale of goods within a building is $125. Yeah. All right. Um, Cause I know like up at Walmart North, there's usually a company that comes in with the tent in the parking lot. Um, so, so they would need, are, are we, is that going to be included in our budget this yes. year for the, uh, the fees? That, okay. All right. Ms. Jackson, Jackson, questions? You're on mute, April. The lettering under number four and 811.020. Um, could you explain that to me? Where are you at again? I'm sorry. Okay, it's under chapter 8.11. Yes. And it's under B, number four. And it's I. Yeah, so this is a, a local amendment that was adopted that would allow the fire marshal to put different signage on building based on specific hazards that we may be encountering while being in the building. So if there was a building that was in some type of disrepair that needed certain work done on it, that the fire marshal could have placards made and would go on the exterior of the wall that would allow units responding uh, when they saw that they could see the marking which would identify some type of hazard that was in the building to allow our personnel to know what they're getting ready to encounter. Excellent. I'm just, I just, I didn't understand. So if you don't understand and say ask, so I, I asked so that you really explained it in detail. Thank you. Absolutely. And you okay with uh, April moving forward? Certainly, yes. Yes, I am. Okay, fine. Ms. Blake? Uh, no questions and move it forward. Thank you. Mrs. Gregory? No questions, move it forward. Thank you. All right, this, uh, Ms. Nichols, we'll get this on the next agenda, please. We'll move that forward. Council President, I, I have a comment to add to the ordinance that was just approved for consensus. Just so the city clerk is aware, amendments to subsection uh, B6 of chapter 811.020, excuse me, 20 had been made before this particular ordinance. Those amendments, however, are not documented on the city's uh, muni code database specifically subsections K, L, and M uh, were not added to the Municode uh, database. I would suggest that those uh, be included as part of the upload for this ordinance when and if it's eventually adopted. I've confirmed with the chief that amendments to subsection B6 had already been made and approved by the council to add subsection K, L, and M previously. They just need to be documented on the Unicode. Mr. Sullivan, were they within the past year? I see the chief nodding his head, yes. Okay, that's why they're not there yet. Um, they haven't been codified. Well, they're codified. They just haven't been uploaded to the Municode database. They're okay. codified upon adoption. Okay. Could you just follow up offline on that after we finish to make sure you're on the same page? Great, thank you. Okay, um, next we have a budget amendment to purchase EnterGov software. Uh, and Deputy City Administrator Andy Kittrow will handle that. Mr. Kittrow. Hi, everyone. Um, so this is um, being brought back. Um, this was presented at the previous work session. I passed along some additional information um, regarding some of the breakdowns for um, the budgeting. Um, so I wanted to open it up for further discussion from council um, regarding the information that was shared or additional questions that, that, that exist right now. Okay, um, I will open the floor to questions, but at this time we will not, we'll have a separate vote on whether to move it forward. So 
So at this point in time, we'll just entertain questions uh, regarding the information that Mr. Kitro provided. So Mr. Uh, Boda. Uh, I, I appreciate the information that, that uh, Mr. Kitro provided. Uh, and I, I think this is overall gonna uh, make a make a lot of a lot of things much more smoother and uh especially on the user side or the uh those who are registering properties or those you know on on that end and then also on our side i think it's going to on our side it's going to be much more efficient thank you ms jackson i think i was mayor no other questions or comments thank you ms blake Uh, no questions or comments. Ms. Gregory? No questions or comments. Well, I guess that leaves it to me because I got a bunch of them. Um, and if I could, let me go down through the uh, thing. And is um, Amanda still on the call? Okay. Uh, first up, um, there's $127,000 coming from infrastructure and development. And uh, it, it was a construction inspector vacancy because it's not hired due to COVID. Um, and it says the job will be posted and hired before the end of the fiscal year. Uh, planner one vacancy, not a hire, not hired due to COVID. Um, administration requests to not hire essential positions of the department could manage with vacancy. Um, and that position is not in the budget, correct? No, the position is in the budget. It, it it's stayed in the budget, yes. This year's budget, okay. Yes. Um, and administrative assistant, is that in the budget? It is, yes. So those two positions we decided not to fill until um, the next fiscal year, so July 1. So we took their salary savings to apply towards Intergov the inspector, as we had noted, we did want to fill that position this year, and we have. We have the new inspector starting here in May. So in the transfer for Intergov, we had accounted for that position to start May 1st. Um, they're actually going to start a little bit later in May, so we, we have um, ample budget left in the salary account for that position. Okay, and you have and you have no problem with any of these, any of this $127,000? Yeah, correct. So it the bulk of it is salary and then the associated health insurance with those three positions. Uh, there was also some overtime that we're looking like we we're, aren't going to need and then a couple other miscellaneous accounts. So I, I was comfortable with those um, that transfer. Yes. Okay. Uh, have you seen the, the new software? A demonstration of the new software? Yeah, so our, our staff, our, my team has gotten a demonstration. It's, it's been a little bit of time since I've seen it, but we have seen it as well and, and we'll be using it. What do you think of it? It's, it's good. So it makes it more interactive where right now for our inspection staff, we're uploading PDFs. So it's kind of very static. So instead of having um, a dynamic form that we're using that the software has, instead we print an inspection report, we scan it and we upload it as a PDF. So um, this makes it more inclusive also with the properties so that if we have something associated with a specific property, we could see what HCDD has put in associated with that property. They in turn can see what we're looking at. So right now we don't have that. So if we're looking at a permit or if they're looking at a violation, they are in completely different systems right now. So we we don't necessarily know what the other department would be doing as far as um, permits or violations on any given property without having further dialogue. So it, it will be nice to have all that in one place. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I don't have any questions on the uh, housing community development. Um, I do have questions on the water and surf fund. Uh, my biggest issue with this, to be frank, is we're going to take $19,000 from the water and sewer fund, and we're going to ask people to pay 6% more for the water and sewer fund uh, this coming year. Um, I, have, I have an issue with that. 
Um, any, is there any, does anybody else have a concern about that? So I'll, I'll just make a comment and I hear the concern. Typically um, when we, because of the way the water and sewer fund is set up with what Amanda's team does, um, it pulls from several accounts. Part of infrastructure development deals with the utilities and the permitting of, of, of that piece. So typically with a lot of projects, a piece will come from water and sewer, the collective, whether it's salaries or just additional um, accounting when we're doing capital projects. So because this being a big expense, we thought about 10% of this project would be shared from the water and sewer fund. But um, that's kind of how we determine that. Uh, and if Amanda wants to speak any more to that, but I'll just kind of explain how that came to, to be. I'll just add, so the positions that we talked about that are vacant are all shared. Um, their salaries are one third from the general fund, one third from water and one third from sewer. So that's that's just kind of how um, the, the DID staff salaries are set up. So when we have a vacancy like that, it does span across um, both general fund and water and sewer funds. Okay. Is, I do have a question. It's an explanation, but I still have a problem with it. Um, Ms. Blake, you were going to say something? Yeah, I want to just ask, this was the same, is, this is the same software that was on like the wish list for the budget coming up? Is that correct? Yes, it's, uh, it's actually, it, yes. Yeah. Well, we would not have to, of course, fund it if, if we fund it now, it yeah. wouldn't be a request. It's been there a couple of years now. And um, the other, the other, I have a couple more questions. The other question is, um, how many of the other programs of other type systems, uh, and I understand the logic, the basic logic about going to uh, the same upgrade to Munis. I have a concern because Munis had its flaws and they're waiting for the next quote generation, which comes at a higher price, obviously. And um, I did ask the question, and I'm not sure whether I got the a direct answer. But how long has this system, the new one, been in use? So um, each one of these software things have iterations so there's upgrades to each one uh, we've been exploring integrov uh, for the last three years since i've been here so i know it's been around since at least um, 2017 i would have to double check to see if how far it's been available prior to that start date um i think it's a i think it's five years old so it's it's a relatively newer software it's comprehensive software but i'd have to double check on um, in the original. I'll just add, you know, there, there are two different mechanisms and two different divisions of the parent company. And Munis is a, the, what we have been used to for many years is more clunky. That is, that is the honest truth, but we are, um, IS is um, going through the testing mechanism for the new, the newest version right now. So that's going to come live to our team, um, you know, I think in May, if not June. Um, and so that will be then a web-based version that will be much more user-friendly. Um, but the, the InterGov version is much more user-friendly, um, but they, they pair together well. Um, and Bill has, has done, done uh, uh, multiple rounds of um, you know, chatting with their, their tech people, making sure that it was going to integrate with ours. Our teams have done um, at least two um, run-throughs with their staff to make sure that they're comfortable with it. Because uh, again, we don't want to buy, we realize this is a lot of money. We don't want to buy software that isn't going to work for us. We don't want to buy software that staff's not going to use. So we, we knew that their buy-in was going to be key here. And we do feel that um, we are going to get the bang for the buck and the, the ability for our teams to be able to communicate with one another and solve a problem that, you know, they never just live in, in DID. It's it's DID, it's HDDD, it's finance, they all need to talk, and this software is going to enable us to do that. 
Is this software also the one that requires like the six tablets and the- No, the, that's, that's different. That's, that's a whole different thing? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, and the last question I have is, with the cost of this kind of project, how come we didn't put it out for an RFP? Thank you. So, um, this is a, I, I wish Jennifer was here. So when we, because of it being a Tyler Tech product, they're the only ones who have it. So an RFP, we wouldn't be going out for a formal solicitation for a proprietary software platform from a, a different company because that different company would not be able to integrate with our current system through Munis and our other software platforms. So it's a sole source. Um, so there is no other company that offers this exact product. If we would have wanted to do an RFP, we would have looked at potentially other platforms um, that can do buildings and permit inspections or um, housing and development, which we have CompK right now that does some of the code enforcement infractions. But this is the only one that's available right now that um, speaks to, that's integrated with Munis, our financial side of things. So that's that's why we chose or wanted to go with with, with this I side think, of it. Basically. Okay. I, I think that's a flawed way of looking at it personally. We're looking at a legacy system that has a tremendous amount of issues. Supposing I said to you that there was a company that's out there that has a product that's been in the market for four years and has a proven track record and could put the whole thing in at the same time mm -hmm. and was cheaper. Should we consider that? Um, the consideration would be if, and, and you know, Bill's not here right this second, but is it compatible with, if our goal is for all of our systems to talk to each other and it's compatible, then that is something to consider. If it's not compatible, then we would in a sense be creating a, a, another silo of software and, and is that our goal? Um, so again, it wouldn't, it may or may not speak with the Comcate system that currently exists. It may not speak with Munis. Um, so I guess that, that again becomes the, it, it is a good question um, that, that can be raised is, is what is the goal with any of these software packages is how much they communicate with each other and how much do we have to worry about that on the back end. So I, there's definitely pluses and minuses on, on both of those. And Jack, I mean, our team is going through the tests, making sure all the kinks are worked out of this next updated version. So I, I don't think it is fair to say that it is, you know, um, you know, a dated program. What we were using was dated, but what we're going to is not. It is a, the 2019 version. Um, and, you know, I, I trust Bill's recommendation that it is, uh, it is a, it works well. It's going to work well for our team. And, uh, the folks that have been uh, testing it to make sure there aren't any, the workflows are all working well, um, have enjoyed it. Um, so, you know, we're, we're not okay. looking to, to, you know. Can I ask a question? The, the only thing that I, the, and I, the, I'm speaking from okay. experience, that's the only reason I'm, I'm bringing it up. Because I had a legacy program in a business, in a $160 million business, uh, we, we, we took the upgrade. The upgrade turned out to be a disaster. Uh, and it went through the, it went through testing protocols and everything else. And um, the worst case would be that if you, if you ran the RFP to begin with, and it would be clear either by expense or by lack of interface or whatever, or a, a, a program, a new program that had everything in it, um, you would have known that at RFP time, and then you just proceed the way you're proceeding now. I just would feel much more comfortable if um, we had looked at other options at this kind of money. So that's my that's my only point. Can I say something, Jack? Do we know of any other city that uses this? 
that was it. Um, I, um, Ron Strickler is has has popped online. He has done a little bit more more research on the actual product because he would be a recipient just as much as Amanda. Um, he's got a couple comments that may help the conversation. So, if I could give him you know sixty seconds to add to this. Yeah, but my question hasn't been answered. <laughs> April, I believe in in Andy's materials that he shared uh, with council, there were seven or eight other cities just in Maryland that use this. And again, we're you know larger cities use this, not not smaller cities. Um, so some of the other bigger players do use this. And how successful has it been? I mean, I'm not just being a thorn in your side i just need to know you know i mean i'm kind of like jack has it been successful within either one of these cities how successful is it is it problematic or what i if i could speak miss jackson mr heath the uh, the two um specific cities that i had done some research in were in um i believe it was boulder colorado and kansas city so in both of those instances, in reviewing their documents and material, they are extremely happy with the use of the product. And um, initially, the project was rolled out in 2012. So it has been around for nine years. Um, right off the bat, with any new software, there were some glitches and some issues. Um, I know there was, I believe it was in Nevada, there was a city that was one of the very first um, cities that it was introduced in. Uh, the big issues that we face, I think, interdepartment wise, uh, Amanda and John, uh, Chief Tall could, could uh, vouch to this and, and even with the police department now, with this software, our ability to integrate what we do on a daily basis is, it's, I mean, it's gonna expand. Um, you know, it's going to multiply. So it, with our current operating system with Comcate, so HCDD is the only system that uses Comcate right now. So Comcate does not communicate with Munis. Um, when we have to move information from Munis to, to Comcate and vice versa, it's a process that involves manpower and time and information. And if we say we went to a property at, at Main Street, you know, call it 105, if we went to 105 Main Street with this new system and we're doing an inspection, we will be able to verify that DID has done their inspection, that the fire department has done their inspection. We can see how many calls for service they've had from the fire department. The ability to integrate this system with Munis is probably the most important part of it because it streamlines the process. And then the other piece that I think is very important to remember is the ability for the user to access this system, uh, specifically for Amanda and permitting and HCDD as well. Uh, they are able to actually submit permitting requests online to eliminate the need for mailing or in-office visits uh, with their plans and documents that can, that can be streamlined and approved directly by permitting after reviewing that information. Uh, the same thing goes ultimately what my goal with this system would be is to, to set up some type of access for our property owners in the city to register their properties online through the system um, that would eliminate a lot of the manpower that takes place with the city employees right now. So I think probably the most important piece is the ability to tie into Munis um, and then the ability for us to work interdepartmentally with other permitting and fire and police where everything will be viewable on one screen. Um, I know the upfront cost is, is high, but I do believe that ultimately it's gonna pay off in the long run for both our constituents and the city employees. Um, and I'd be happy to share some of that information uh, from those uh, other city websites and just some feedback that I found in my research. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Follow-up question, uh, does Boulder, did, or did Boulder and um, uh, what was it, Kansas City, did they have Munis? They did. Okay. Have a question. Um, I don't have any. Uh, I don't have any further questions. Um, I do. I have, I have a question. Go right ahead. I just want to go back to the to the tablets for a minute, and I know that the software is unrelated, but 
if requesting the tablets, I think it was like six to eight tablets for our code departments to go out and coordinate with each other. If we don't have this software, then they're, are they even able to use the tablets in the same function? Because we were considering looking at the tablets with uh, ease and communication with each department. And so if we don't have this software, the tablets and the, the, the packs, I guess the internet packs that go with the tablets is a mute point. Or do that we have to have, we have to have both. April, I think those tablets were for uh, public works. Am I correct, Amanda? I don't think it was for HCDD. That, that's correct. It was, it's a work order system. It's a different module. They're called modules or software packages. There's several underneath this, but the work orders would be for the field operations team who goes deployed and for us to submit work orders to them and them to complete job. Traffic lights out, potholes being repaired limbs down, et cetera, they would be working off of those tablets to work on their work orders and getting updates and submitting ticket information in real time. Slightly unrelated because one's more of an inspection side of it and one is more of a maintenance side of it. So they're independent. Okay. And Angela, okay. HCDD has um, computer access on their vehicles, so they, they'll be able to utilize this, this software. And they are they are currently using the iPads in the vehicles, and I think it's important to note that at, after the pandemic, the shift of computers to actual having mobile devices such as laptops uh, could help to eliminate the need for some of those uh, the tablets. And with, from the HCDD standpoint, there would still need to be some type of access point. But I think um, if they have tablets, much like I do now, that uh, with the operating systems, that the computers would be sufficient. What is the what is the request now? What's prompting the request earlier than us finishing going through the budget process? What I know that we had talked about it as we're looking at our line items and we're our department needs, and we're still having a lot of discussions about that. And then this comes to the work session. What what is it about about the need now versus waiting for us to go through the process of the budget? So, uh, Angela, it's it's more of an accounting situation where right now we're in the FY21 budget where we have available funds from what was allocated last year based off of some salary savings. So we have monies available. Uh, the last two years we brought Intergov before you, it has not made it because we had higher priorities. We didn't have the funding there. So it is either using new money or found money in a sense. Either way, it's so if you all decided not to pass it, we're not hiring anybody tomorrow. That money would, in a sense, be savings. And then we would say, hey, can we have this next year? So it, it's, it's more of an accounting situation, but rather than using new money or, or, or picking Intergov over a different priority if, if you had a set budget uh, for this upcoming year. I have one, uh, one last question. I'm not sure that I asked the question before. In the financial uh, health, were these use of unused funds reflected in, in Keith's thing that we saw the first day of the uh, budget? Um, so I'm going to try to answer that. Um, in Keith's presentation with that mm -hmm. any of the use of additional funds were things that were not already allocated from the total budget. Since those three positions, because it's internal money that was found, it, it doesn't impact that. Any of the new things would have been things above and beyond. So it would have been budget amendments or, or additional authorization to use new money. Um, so this was already, this would have been included in that as, as already existing. Keith didn't when he presented stuff, he wasn't like, oh, well, we have salary savings from these vacancies and these vacancies. So there, <laughs> and most of his budget presentation wasn't actually on current FY21. It was previous year. So um, th there's a lot. I, I don't want to go into how much detail with, I mean, I can go into as much details as you all, but I don't want it to get 
Oh, that's okay. Stuck in the weeds. That's okay. Jack, I have one other question. Would would a user such as who's on the call now, Lynn Bratton, who wants to pay her, uh, hi Lynn, who wants to pay her landlord license fees, can she pay that through her account on that system, or does she still have to come in with a check? That's much like the permitting request. Um, we would be looking to set up that availability for renewals and uh, online submissions for new and renewal registrations. So she would ultimately be able to pay for it through, through that? Yes, and that would be something through the system that we would be able to develop, yes. Okay. With the approval Is this, does of finance this system also online. have the ability for people to pay their property taxes online? Just, just a question. That's a different mechanism that we are standing up currently. Through Munis or Paymentus, Paymentus. Okay, I think uh, let's let's I'll pull the uh, council now to see if uh, we have the uh, desire to move it forward. Mr. Boda. I support moving it forward. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. I do too. Ms. Blake. Agree. Move it forward. Mrs. Gregory. Um, move it forward. Okay. We have the votes to move it forward. Um, Ms. Ms. Nichols, if you could uh, put that on the agenda, I would appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for their participation. Um, we have one more item on the agenda that's been added, and that's the uh, presentation around, relative to the zoo budget. And Mr. Kittrow is going to handle that for us. Mr. President, I think there was one other item before that. Um, the oh, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I do. I made a note and I put it in the wrong side. We do have one more. Uh, this is to amend the uh, chapter 15.26 of the rental of residential premises in the Salisbury City Code by adding section 15.26045, fair housing. Uh, and, um, Ms. Glanz or Mr. Kittrow, who's going to handle that? Uh, Mr. President, I have with me Johanna Cooper, who has been, uh, you've met her before and did the initial presentation. She's been interning in our office uh, this entire year, and uh, she has uh, put the finishing touches on this and will lead us uh, in the discussion moving forward. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon, Johanna. Hello, thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, so before you was an ordinance that would require all landlords and property managers in the city to um, essentially disclose all of their practices related to um, fees, especially, um, and background checks, especially for criminal um, history. So this would require um, on all promotional materials, including websites um, and flyers and in um, in applications, things like that, to state the period of time that criminal histories are going to be looked back upon um, and describe fees and then any other um, kind of information related to those practices. Um, as you all know, we've determined that the housing barriers are a really complex issue, issue um, but we're hoping to move forward with this um, and reduce at least one of those barriers by allowing participants to know um, up front when they apply um, what kind of background checks they'll be subject to. Um, so we look forward to any questions and any feedback. Mr. President, I'll just add, thank you, Johanna, um, that we did meet with SAPOA um, at the end of March and had a really good initial conversation on this topic. Um, and you know, there are many more conversations that need to have to continue to, to tackle these issues, but um, there was consensus in the room of um, everybody that was there uh, that this is a fair um, uh, requirement to be putting on uh, the landlord businesses in Salisbury. Um, so uh, I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that because that was the ask to, um, you know, make sure we, we chatted with them and to start having conversations more regularly. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the uh, council, Mr. Boda? Um, I've, I've looked through it and I think this is, uh, you know, I, I think anytime you do a credit check or, you know, whether somebody's buying a cell phone or renting a house, uh, that 
you know, that information of what's being looked at should be provided to the individual up front. Um, we do it when we hire people at Walmart because uh, sometimes it does require that, and you have to go through and explain it to them what's 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 going on. And when they get it, because sometimes it sends it to them that they have to fill something out, and that you have to make sure make sure you fill it out truthfully too. So there there's a there there's a part to it where if they don't provide the right information or omit something, you know, it, they they won't get approved. Uh, so that that's something that I think that they should have as a as a practice anyway. So you're for moving it forward? Yes. Okay. Ms. Jackson? I agree, and we can move it forward. Thank you. Ms. Blake? I, I had a question. Um, how many people were in that SAPOA meeting, or how many, I guess, SAPOA members were in that meeting? And was it just one meeting you had with them, or was it multiple? Uh, we've just had one meeting on this topic to date. Um, we are going to get back together uh, to continue the conversation on next steps. Uh, but there were probably a total of 15 or so folks in the room. The president uh, of SAPOA was there, so I imagine he also shared the conversation um, with others after the fact. Um, I didn't hear any um, other feedback after, um, and I invited folks to make sure they shared it if they had issues or concerns. Angela, you for moving it forward? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Gregory? I think this is great and it adds a lot of much needed transparency to this. So yeah, move it forward. All right. Uh, Mrs. Nichols, we have uh, the votes to move it forward for uh, the next uh, meeting. And if you would do that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, and like I said, now, now I have to, uh, the time to talk about the zoo budget. So Mr. Kittrow, uh, you can- I have a question that before you move on, Jack, can I interject something? Sure. Just, just for clarity, because we've been voting on the issues to move something forward, but we haven't heard your vote. I know we have enough votes to move it forward, but we have to put our vote on record. Yeah. Are you declining a vote or? No, it doesn't. It, it, the, the vote here is just to make sure we have a majority. I vote move it forward. Okay, thanks. Um, Mr. Kitzrow. Yes, so this document right here in front of you all is um, what I think will be the easiest way to help explain uh, the, the proposal. So if you look currently, you'll where it says currently, Andy, you'll oh, sorry, my fault. Um, so if you look at um, where it says currently, uh, this is how the city operates from a budgetary standpoint. We have kind of two buckets. We have the city of Salisbury with what most people think is like the day-to-day the -day zoo operations, animal care, the actual facility, most of the staff. Um, and then uh, where the zoo commission comes in, uh, they look at more of the programming and events. So historically, um, when the zoo started off, we didn't have an education department. We didn't have a bistro. We had animals and caretakers. So as that has grown, uh, the zoo commission uh, took it upon itself to help create additional um, activities for youth and families to enjoy the zoo. Um, whether it was education and summer camps um, or you know something like getting ice cream from the concession stand um, to events like um, zubilation, things like that. They have helped create and foster these activities. Um, this is about $350,000 worth of, of business that the Zoo Commission has, has been responsible for historically. What we are proposing, but, but right now the way the Zoo Commission, that all operates through an independent accounting system through the Zoo Commission, their own bank account, not the city of Salisbury bank account. All of the staff, um, are paid through the city, and then the zoo commission reimburses the city for all of those staffing costs, all of these full-time educators um, and part-time people who work um, in the gift shop or work in the concession stand or greeters. 
Um, then there's other mechanisms that the Zoo Commission currently has to, to collect revenue to offset um, some of those expenditures, uh, specifically education grants. They receive education grants to help pay for the full-time salaries of some of our positions. And one of them is a big MSDE grant. There's also a couple endowment grants where we collect revenue to also help subsidize uh, some of those operations and programming. Um, through several conversations with the Zoo Commission, um, and, and Jack was part of that, and, and our Zoo staff, uh, we felt it appropriate to shift the way in which we budget and to bring basically all operations at the zoo in-house through the city mm -hmm. finance department. So if you look at the proposed, everything in red is what would be shifting over to the responsibility of the city. Um, so all of the staff would continually be paid for us, but we wouldn't receive a contribution from a direct contribution line for line for those expenditures from the zoo commission. But we would also collect all of the revenues, the net revenues associated with all of the programs and events. All of the gate revenue would actually come to the city rather to the zoo commission. Um, and then all of the net revenue and proceeds from the concessions and the gift shop sales would come to the city. So instead of going there and then being written a check back to us, it all comes to us. But the zoo commission would still serve a vital role. As, the, as a nonprofit, they would continue to be our uh, philanthropic arm one of our philanthropic arms to collect um, private donations to manage some of our endowments that are over at the Community Foundation. Um, also manage some of our grants um, that we're receiving that need to go through a 501c3. Um, but with this shift, um, the most important thing is to note is, is how it's still going to be a break even. Our programs and our events will continue to be a break even venture. So no additional uh, requirement from the city to subsidize these programs. So um, once we do all of our revenue and all of our expenditures for the year, uh, whatever that net remaining balance is, the Zoo Commission will subsidize that with the monies that they collect through private donations or the funding that they have in their endowments and then the grant. So they will still make a contribution back to the city to, to bring that balance up to even. Um, so from a council standpoint, you won't really see a difference. There is no additional line item. Um, there will be some additional funding increases, but it'll be a wash. Um, there won't be an additional um, budgetary impact. It won't be more, uh, more of, a, of, of a use, as, as Keith would say. Um, we think it's appropriate um, to move in this direction to keep the money here. Um, and uh, I think it's a good direction for us to go. It helps us have better control over the accounting of our programs. Um, and President Heath, I'll turn, I know you sit on the Zoo Commission. You're more than welcome to add any additional comments at this time. Yes, um, I, I'd just like to let everybody know that the, uh, it was unanimous for the Zoo Commission to make these changes. It's a lot cleaner and it also protects the, um, protects the Zoo Commission in terms of the funding that they can collect through grants as a, a 501c3. So, um, Everybody's in agreement. It doesn't change the budget whatsoever. It just moves it. Uh, and the, the funding from the Zoo Commission, the donations will be transferred as they, as they have been in the past. But um, actually when the mayor and I first started talking um, about this before he left, um, he, he kept saying, and it's true, it's the Salisbury Zoo. And uh, we need to make sure that it's there. And that's why, uh, we began the discussions. And uh, the current chairman um, worked with Andy uh, and uh, Jim uh, James Mayberry. Mayberry. James Mary Mayberry worked with Andy uh, and worked and worked out the uh, the alignment that you just saw. So uh, I'll open it up now to any questions, Mr. Boda. I mean this just seems like it's streamlining it to make the process a lot a lot simpler and and like you said you know more accountability on 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 the monies received on a daily basis whether whether it's stuff at the gift shop or the donations or the, the mission donations so i think this is a good thing and uh let the zoo commission focus on what they do best uh and not have to worry about uh this the, these menial uh daily tasks 
Appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. Jackson. Um, I feel it's a great thing. I have no questions. Um, we can move it forward. Do whatever Thank you, need. April. Thank you. Ms. Blake. Uh, no questions and go ahead and move it forward. Thank you. Mrs. Gregory. No questions, move it forward. Thank you. I agree. Okay. Uh, at this time, just so uh, we don't have to keep everybody holding on for the uh, special meeting, uh, I'll entertain the uh, comments from the administration, closing comments from the administration first, Ms. Glanz. Um, I, I was not prepared to make those, Andy. <laughs> I'll let you if you have oh, Okay. <laughs> Andy? I don't have many uh, additional comments. I know we always emphasize the importance through this pandemic to get vaccinated and continue to, to move forward in that capacity. Um, those who are following social media, you know that uh, Mayor Major Mayor Day is back in town. Um, so in the next couple of weeks, you may, you may be seeing him late in May. So when you see that familiar face pop on here, don't be surprised. Thank you. Mr. Boda. No, it was a beautiful weekend in, on Delmarva. Uh, I was up in Rock Hall on Saturday. Uh, good times up there. Uh, they had a uh, municipal election up there. There was a guy riding around in his lawnmower with his campaign sign on the back. So, Jack, that's an idea for you next time. Um, <laughs> make sure it's a zero turn lawnmower. Uh, now just uh, everybody get vaccinated. Uh, you know, I, I got the Pfizer shot, had no issues. Uh, uh, you know, maybe stay away from the Moderna. The Pfizer one seems to be the good one. So, um, anyway, I'll have a good week. Thank you. Ms. Jackson. Jack and Mir and possibly Ron Strickler, I have not forgotten that I would like to speak to you all, um, possibly next week in reference to some housing conditions in my district. Um, I will contact you all to let you know, you know, when it's available for me or available for even for you all. But we, we need to have this conversation. We need really need to have this conversation um, because I'm at Wits and Wade, and I've had many of my constituents call me with concerns. Um, so we will get to that. I'm also in YouTube as well, Julia. Um, as Mir said, please, if you haven't gotten your vaccine, get it. And be mindful to social distance and um, wear your mask and sanitize. And that's all I have to say for the evening. Everybody have a blessed evening. Thank you, April. Angela? Just my big thing, of course, if you're healthy enough, donate blood. Um, I know as, as of last week, uh, our region is really in a critical spot for blood donations um, and our supply is, is really not even there. So please, if you're healthy enough, donate blood. Thank you, Mrs. Gregory. Um, just want to say I'm thankful for the rain that just rolled through here. My allergies are feeling much better already. <laughs> the, um, but yeah, uh, just go get vaccinated. We're doing great. Um, we have some of the best vaccination numbers in the state, but we could be doing better. So, so go, please go get your vaccination. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, I'd like to uh, reinforce what Angela said about the blood. We are in a crisis uh, and it's gonna take uh, a lot of blood to get us out of that. So please, if you're able to, please donate. And relative to the pollen, I went to the uh, Mission Barbecue ribbon cutting today. And when I came home, I looked like the Grinch. I was covered in green. Um, so uh, everybody uh, have a good weekend. But before I do that, uh, a good week. But before I do that, is, is there, are there any questions from the audience? Please identify yourself and we'll give you a few minutes to make your comments. Well, Jack, I wanna say one thing. Yeah. It's Angela, um, Councilwoman Angela Blake's birthday today. She's 25, you all. What? <laughs> happy birthday, Angela. <laughs> yes, happy birthday. 25 Angela. and holding, right? Yes. <laughs> oh, I've been hold I'm holding that for a long time. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, we have Colin's got his hand raised. Colin. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I have been talking to Julia, so she's aware of my comments, but I just wanted to go on record. Um, uh, you know, this uh, fair housing, I, we, we're, we're supportive, but I'm, I'm concerned a little bit about the language that's in the, the current draft of all promotional materials. Um, I, we're supportive of the website and, of course, applications um, and maybe prominent in the office. But when you when you have words like promotional materials, it means uh, advertising, it means billboards, it means radio, it means TV. Uh, and I want to make sure that whatever is in, in writing as an ordinance doesn't mean that everything that they print or produce has to have a disclosure statement um, about and then of course a sort of a sample of what what that disclosure statement would read um, so I, I I'd like to narrow it down to if, if it if they mean website if they mean um, application great fine absolutely support it but but promotional material needs to be a little bit more defined uh, Mr. Kitro, any any comments about that? And Ju Julia has responded to that, and I think yeah. Uh, okay. him, but. Jack, um, that that wasn't the goal of, of the legislation. It, it slipped past me, so I've already asked. I've already made the changes and emailed them to Ashley to review and uh, sent them to Kim. Um, so it, it, the goal is just to have it on applications website in the office. I, it is unreal. It's not fair and, and realistic to expect someone to put all of that on, uh, you know, any any type of promotional material. I don't think so. Um, that'll be what what you'll see next next time. Great, thank you. Co problem solved, Colin. Hey, if everything was that easy, it'd be great. <laughs> I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Anyone else? All right. Seeing none, I will adjourn the work session, and we will now call the meeting, the special meeting of May 3rd, 2021 to order. Uh, I'll need a motion and a second to adopt the legislative agenda. So moved. So moved. Uh, April second. had it first. Oh. I'll give it to April second. first and give it to Mirror with the second. I'll call the motion. All those in favor of adopting the legislative agenda, please signify by saying aye. Mr. Boda. Aye. Ms. Jackson? Aye. Ms. Blake? Aye. Mrs. Gregory? Aye. And the chair votes aye. The legislative agenda is adopted by a vote of five to zero. I'll entertain a motion to approve ordinance number 2665 for the first reading. So move. Second. Ms. Jackson? Ms. Blake? Mr. Sullivan? Yes, Thank you, Mr. President. Ordinance number 2665, an ordinance of the City of Salisbury approving a budget amendment of the FY 2021 general fund budget to appropriate funds to the Salisbury Fire Department's building account for HVAC repairs. Whereas the Salisbury Fire Department has experienced a failure of the HVAC condensing unit and internal coil. Whereas the failure has resulted in a loss of the air conditioning throughout the entire Salisbury Fire Department building. Whereas the cost to cover the necessary repairs is estimated to be $31,945. Whereas the Salisbury Fire Department has determined that there are insufficient funds available in other accounts to transfer to cover the amount required to cover the cost of the aforesaid repair. Now, therefore, be it enacted and ordained by the Council of the City of Salisbury, Maryland, as follows. Section 1. City of Salisbury's fiscal year 2021 general fund budget be and, he, be and is hereby amended as follows. Increase the current year surplus account 01000-469810 by $31,945. Increase the Salisbury Fire Department's building account 24035-534301 by $31,945. Be further enacted and ordained by the Council of the City of Salisbury, Maryland as follows. Section two is the intention of the Mayor and Council of the City of Salisbury. Each provision of this ordinance shall be deemed independent of all other provisions herein. Section three, it is, to further, it is further the intention of the mayor and council of the city of Salisbury that any section, paragraph, subsection, clause, or provision of this ordinance 
shall be adjudged invalid, unconstitutional, or otherwise unenforceable under Maryland or federal law. Such adjudication shall apply only to the section, paragraph, subsection, clause of provisions to the judge, and all the provisions of this ordinance shall remain and shall be deemed valid and enforceable. Section four, the recitals set forth here and above are incorporated into this section of the ordinance as if such recitals were specifically set forth at length in this section four. Section five, this ordinance shall take effect from and after the date of its final passage. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Questions or comments, Mr. Boda? I, I guess I'll support this. I don't want to see the chief and Jimmy sweating too much uh, through the dog days of summer. So we'll give it. Uh, that's big of you. Um, Ms. Jackson. Move. You're on mute, April. I'm fine with it. I'm listening, Mayor Pierce. I know. Ms. Blake. Obviously, yes. Okay. Mrs. Gregory. Yes. All right. Um, I'll call the motion now. All those in favor of ordinance number 2665 for the first reading, please signify by saying aye. Those opposed, say nay. Mr. Boda? Aye. Ms. Jackson? Aye. Ms. Blake. Aye. Mrs. Gregory. Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion to approve ordinance number 2665 is approved by a vote of five to zero. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, thank everyone who participated today. It was a um, pretty interesting meeting. Um, and uh, with nothing else, everybody have a good week. And uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.